Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, we have uh, a multi-volume author and longtime therapist, sex therapist, couples therapist, trauma therapist, and cheesemaker, Ruth Cohn with us today. And um, I'm super excited about this conversation. So um, I wonder if you want to say a word or two about um, a about you know how you came to doing this work and uh, and and what um, you know what you're hoping to get out of today, Ruth. Okay, I will. First of all, I wanted to say, as Ruth Lanny's always said in all her webinars, she would always say, "Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be." And I always love that. And it reminded me that I know all the webinars by heart because I listened to them so many times over and over. And I was saying to Lars before we began that one of the great blessings of the pandemic for me um, has been this series from EEG Learn where because we were so isolated and we were alone and we didn't have conferences and we couldn't talk face to face anymore, I would get these live webinars into my kitchen when I was self-regulating, stirring my cheese vat, and I would, it started with Ed Hamlin Gospel Hour, or Grateful Ed Gospel Hour, and he was the only one we had, and I would listen to that one over and over again. My point being, I am so thrilled to be a part of this thing, and I'm so grateful to Lars for making this happen and for keeping me company and keeping me growing with neurofeedback during this difficult and weird couple of years that we've been so isolated. And it's interesting, those of us who are children of neglect have been very ambivalent about the isolation of the pandemic, because on one hand, it's so normal to be alone so much when one has a neglect history, it's almost like easier. And on the other hand, um, we keep hearing you know, how weird it is, and it is in some ways, as well as all the fear that went with it. So um, it's a good segue into our topic, which is about neglect and the amb ambivalence about being connected and being alone. So how I got involved in this, um, first of all, Lars um, made a little bit of a reference to the fact that I'm a cheesemaker, and that is a ready source of metaphor at all times. Um, I started making cheese about four or five years ago, and it bit me like a like a bug. I, I always say cheese making is not a hobby, it's a diagnosis for me, and um, it keeps me regulated. So I will answer the question how I got, got involved in this work in the first place. I've been at it for a very long time. Um, the PTSD diagnosis came along in 1980. And at that time, um, we were just starting to speak out loud about, well, we had the Vietnam War ending and all the veterans coming home with these terrible symptoms. And then at similar timing, we started speaking out loud about sexual abuse of children and violence against women and children. And being a child of two Holocaust survivors, I had a lot of trauma in my system, in my nervous system. And I didn't know what that was, but I was really compelled by suffering. And I was also very keen to um, understand more about trauma, not knowing how much trauma I had myself, but being very interested in it. So I started following Bessel around, Bessel van der Kolk, who is like the father of the trauma field. And at that time I was here in California and there was no training of any kind about trauma. So I'd have to like fly all over the place to um, hear Bessel speak. And Bessel was one of the first, um, the first mental health people to start talking about the brain. There was one other guy at that time, and his name was Daniel Amen, and he has many, many books, and he was doing exorbitantly expensive brain scans on people. But he was famous for saying that we are the only discipline who doesn't look at the organ we treat. 
And we it's true that psychotherapy field was completely divorced from the neuroscience in the brain um, until Bessel started talking about it. And he started talking about the aberrations in brain function um, when there's trauma and how traumatic memory and all the um, strange sort of patterns we see in the brain um, with PTSD. And he was just starting. And we, at that time, we really had nothing but, quote, the talking cure. So we had the talking cure. Then in the 80s, we got Prozac. That was the big deal. And then we started having this whole sort of parade of treatment uh, treatments. And if you've read The Body Keeps the Score, which you probably have, if you haven't, you must. Um, and to me, the body keeps the score is kind of like a chronicle of my career because everything Bessel said to do, I went out and did. So first we got EMDR. So I learned EMDR and I started practicing that, which I loved because I could move my arms during the session and I didn't have to sit still. And then we got sensory motor psychotherapy and I commuted across the country for five years to train in sensory motor and I took workshops with Peter Levine and somatic experiencing. And I was really inspired to help people get through these horrible trauma histories and these horrible symptoms. And more than anything, these relationship difficulties much quicker because my own experience was that it was endless therapy and it took so long to feel better if ever. So I was always looking for something that would speed things up. And then finally in, 19, in 20, 20, 2009 at the trauma conference, Bessel's trauma conference, I heard Seaburn speak and that was it. I was so thrilled to learn about neurofeedback and I was so in awe of Seaburn that I signed up to do neurofeedback training as fast as I could. And ever since then, I've been really compelled by neurofeedback. And I, I didn't, I mean, sensory motor psychotherapy, somatic experiencing, even EMDR, they're all, they all inform my thinking, but the, the one modality that I really practice the most now is neurofeedback. And I find it the quickest. And it's also such a wonderful way to, for people to process their story without having to tell the story, which is a good segue into the whole topic of neglect. Because I sort of discovered neglect from the side door or the back door. And um, it's a story I've told many times. I'm going to actually not tell it because I'll tell it in the actual webinar. But what I discovered was this whole sort of category of people who didn't think they had a story. In fact, they always said, nothing happened to me. Why do I feel so bad? Nothing happened to me. Well, nothing. That's right. Nothing. A lot of things are supposed to happen. Neglect is all about nothing. It's about missing experiences. So what is the most important thing a therapist, or what I'm now calling a neglect-informed therapist, needs to be aware of is that we have to be able to see what isn't there which sounds like an oxymoron, but we're looking for missing experiences, which means being able to see what isn't there, being able to see what the client can't see, which calls for a certain kind of presence and a certain kind of awareness of one's own experience in the presence of this person, because they won't have the words to tell you what didn't happen because they don't know what didn't happen. They know this vast desert of nothingness, but it's all they've ever known. So they don't really know it's nothing. They think, oh, that's my default mode, right? That's their default mode. It's also a brain area that we'll learn more about. So the therapist has to be aware that there is this veil of nothingness 
and underneath it is this terrible pain about what didn't happen. And they don't know this. They don't know this. What I first found was people who came for therapy because nothing happened to them, so they didn't really think there was anything they needed to work on. Often they came for relationship therapy, and maybe it was because of their partner bringing them in, or maybe it was because their frustration with their partner. And often it was um, driven by some kind of sexual impasse. And that sort of opens another sort of segue for me, um, which is about sexuality. And that is that, you know, I was specializing in um, sexual abuse trauma when I started. So I was hearing a lot about, you know, a lot of my sexual abuse survivor um, clients did have partners and they felt really angry and not understood and hounded and pressured and mad about sex because they didn't want to have sex and they felt like they couldn't. And so many of them had long sexual impasses in their relationships and um, the partner would be really frustrated and really mad. And so I started making a study of you know, what went on in these relationships. And then I went on to train to be a sex therapist. But one of the things that I, I started to realize about these people was they partnered with somebody who didn't give them very much at all. Because one thing we know about trauma, and this is without judgment at all, because I, I have my own, that the nature of trauma is to be fixated on the trauma. So a person who is traumatized and is unhealed is very, very self-concerned. So a partner of a survivor of trauma who's in the throes is not going to get much attention, if any. And so these partners were kind of staying in these relationships for many years where they were getting next to nothing from their partner. And I was thinking, wow, what kind of person would tolerate all these years of nothing? And then it started to kind of congeal or coagulate in cheese making terms into my mind that the person who can tolerate years of married nothing is a person who grew up in years of family nothing. So it is their kind of default mode. It is their, their normal. And so it was only in the course of my started starting to realize this, that I began to put together this model about neglect, because I realized that all this nothing was about being ignored about being invisible, about being kind of a household slave. And I started kind of putting together all these pieces without even realizing that it was my story too, that growing up with two traumatized um, parents, that I also had always been invisible had always been insignificant, had always felt like nothing. So I knew all about that, but it took me a while before I figured it out myself, except that I was really keen and quick to connect with it in another person. And so that's kind of how it all started for me. And what I also learned as I began to learn about the brain was that, um, I mean, one, one of the first books I read about the brain was Alan Shore, which is a very difficult read, but it's very interesting. And basically what it all comes down to is the original development of the brain is through the resonance between the infant brain and the mother's brain through the gaze, right hemisphere to right hemisphere. That's how we develop that's how we grow. That's how we develop, you know, our brain function. And that's how we develop a sense of self. And in the neglect experience, there is a failure of, there is not much gazing. Or if there is, I don't know this, but I can only imagine that if there was anybody there at all, when I was an infant, 
I looked up into a terrified face. I looked up into a depressed face. I looked up into a dissociated, distracted face. I looked up into an angry, overwhelmed face. My mother was married to my father. And I often looked up into empty space where there was no face, which means that the infant brain is under stimulated at this stage. Now, most of us in graduate school saw the, um, the, the videos of the strange situation. So we've seen the videos and I always recommend to my neglect clients to see these because the avoidantly attached is the, the anxious avoidant is the one that correlates most to the uh, child of neglect. And the, the strange situation video, for those of you who aren't familiar with the strange situation, I'll review it. It's an experiment that was done by the early attachment research people, um, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. And what they did was they took a very young child, like a toddler of maybe 18 to 24 months, and they would do an experiment where the child would be in the room with the mother, the mother would leave, the, a stranger would come in, stranger would leave, the mother would come back, and they would study the reaction of the child to basically determine their attachment style. And in the avoidantly attached, the anxious avoidant, the child would be playing alone in the corner, and the mother would be there, and the child wouldn't really be relating to the mother. And then the mother would leave and the child would keep playing and be very self-contained. And then the stranger would come in and the child was not interested, kept playing alone. Stranger left, the mother came back, same thing. And the child looked from the outside to be content, from the outside to be, you know, self-reliance. From the outside, he looked very, you know, like he was having a fine time, but inside his body, all the measures of, you know, frequencies and arousal and anxieties were sky high through the roof. So what we see in these children and in these kids and in these adults is we have both hyper arousal and hypo arousal, which means we have a complicated nervous system, which is both understimulated and overstimulated in different brain areas which means from a neurofeedback standpoint, we've got some challenges because we're dealing with hyperarousal, which means too high of frequencies and hypoarousal, which means too low of frequencies. And so we're having to address both. And- Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, yeah. So the course that you're starting next Friday, the it's four session course, and and we'll post the link. Actually, the language is posted in chat. Um, it's called "Too Much of Nothing," and uh, you've talked about it being referenced to uh, Bob Dylan song, which I listened yeah. to the other day, just to remind myself what it sounds like. And I want, and I know the subtitle for the course is about the developmental trauma of neglect, and I wonder if. As you're talking about, I, you know, for me, thinking about neglect and the way that it works in the brain, is there, it, can you, can you draw out a little bit that link between, um, between what's, between what's development trauma, how that works on the brain and how neglect works? Because it sounds like kind of what you're suggesting, what you're, what, what you're saying is that there is a, there's a, a neuro neurophysiological link between those two. Am I right? Absolutely. I'm sorry I went on so long, Lars. I get oh, no. these rants and I keep going. Yes, good question. First of all, I don't know what the copyright laws are, which is why I'm not blasting the song all the time. <laughs> it's a wonderful song. Go on YouTube and look for too much of nothing. Peter, Paul, and Mary, 19, I think it's 1967. It is a wonderful song, and it's so perfect about this issue. And so um, tell me again, Lars, the, the question that you want me to really kind of be more focused on. Yeah, it's about connecting this uh, this concept. People are, you know, this, this idea of trauma and how it impacts people is less uh, it's it's more and more well understood widely. And what how how is neglect? How are you considering neglect? How is that framed as a 
you know, as a kind of trauma, if, you know, if it's, you know, sort of on a, then this is just my intuitive sense, like, if somebody's experiencing trauma, that that is one kind of effect. But if there is an absence of any kind of interaction, that's a different kind of neuro neurophysiological effect. And, and I, I just wonder if you could tease out a little bit what that actually means for therapists and for for people who've, who've lived through these experiences. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, the, the definition of trauma is overwhelming experience. And what that means in simple language is, it's the stimulus is greater than what the brain is designed to process in its customary way. So the customary way for a brain to process experience certainly when very young is in resonance. And when the mother or the primary caregiver is absent, that is overwhelming. And that's where the um, both the strange situation videos where you see a child and even though they don't show on the outside that they're overwhelmed, on the inside, they're overwhelmed by the disruption or the absence or the disconnections that are coming and going. And um, but it's so deeply buried that they can't really feel it. But when you watch and this is also I always recommend these videos. Um, Ed Tronic has the still face videos where you see even when the, the mother's face is neutral. It's not angry, it's not happy, it's not anything at all, but it just goes still. The child very quickly goes into a panic of overwhelm because our natural state, especially when we're really small, is to be connected. And when we're not connected, we're overwhelmed. And when we're chronically not connected, we are chronically overwhelmed and the brain makes some kind of adaptation to that. And what we often see with neglect is this understimulated brain, which is where I, I located in my early anecdotal study of these people, what I called the three Ps of neglect. And what I identified was procrastination, well, passivity, procrastination, and paralysis. And these are kind of stages of the understimulated brain, the brain that is overwhelmed by nobody being there. And so they default into these under-firing, low-frequency brain states that look like dissociation, or that look like somebody who's zoned out and disconnected. And often our children of neglect are. They seem really kind of not there. And that's what their partners complain about because their world is this, vac this vacant desert of isolation, but it's so familiar that they don't even realize it. They don't even realize that they are so like not in touch with other people. So the therapist, in addition to learning to tap into the nothingness, I have to pay attention to my own inner experience because the only way I will be informed about what's going on inside this person is by what I feel inside myself. So whatever is going on in the brain, which is generally under stimulation is not going to find its way to the prefrontal cortex to be expressed in language. So I have to learn all kinds of other ways to hear the story, which is what makes this work so hard because they express their story. They don't know they're expressing their story, but they express their story in reenactment in um, other what I call languages. And often I can only feel it in my own body or I'll notice I'll be sitting with a person 
And suddenly I'll have an image of a baby looking up into like a blank, you know, room and there being nobody there. And I start getting a feeling inside myself. And if I say something like, um, oh, I'm trying to think what I might say, because we have to be careful not to overshoot, but say something like, wow, I imagine someone being so alone. What do you know about when you're, what, what your mother was going through when you were an infant? And they might tell a story about how the mother lost her both parents in a car accident when they right before they were born, or there were three miscarriages before they were born. So they experience this emptiness, and we get the brain under firing because of it, and they don't have language. And as we begin to draw it out, they begin to get more connections, and then more of the brain comes online, and they become more able to access emotion. I don't know if I'm on track, Doc. It totally is. It's so interesting because I think part of my own difficulty about making the connection between trauma and neglect comes it stems really from this idea of the individual. And what I hear you describing is that the critical part of the sort of uh, health in general of people's people's health and their their ability to function in the world that it's related to attunement. And it's the relationships that we have with other people. So when the relationship, the relationship with with a caregiver, that resonance, if it's traumatic because the person is violent, that's one kind of uh, break. But then there's also the break of when the person is just not there, and they both are variations on that on on the kind of attunement that's happening between those two those two beings. And I, that's so interesting to me that the reciprocity and the attunement is actually the thing rather than, I think there's a long history in mental health of really looking at the individual, even those, you know, even Bowlby and Ainsworth, right? It seemed like what they're really focusing on was what was the failure on the mother's part, not like the attunement and the interaction and stuff. I wonder if I could take it slightly in a different direction. Um, so part of what you've worked on um, in, in, the, in the last, several decades, right, is about uh, in couples therapy. And I wonder, um, one thing that that seems to me, you know, it, there's a taboo around talking about sexuality and, and yeah. sex and therapy and stuff. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, you know, um, for therapists who are recognizing that, oh, this is an important part of my client's lives, what are some ways to really directly address this whole taboo and, and talk about sexual therapy? You bet. Thank you, Lars, because this is so important to me. And for 25 years, I've been trying to make a bridge between the trauma field and the sexuality field. It's been really difficult. And sex is such an important topic and such an important topic to me. And what I would say first is the single best thing we can do for our clients regarding sexuality is become comfortable and fluent to speak about sex out loud because nobody does. Psychiatrists don't talk to their clients about sexual side effects. Cancer therapists don't talk to their clients about what's going to be the impact on sexuality um, of the cancer treatment or the surgeries. Even couples therapists don't inquire about sex. I've had so many couples come in where they say, we've had four different therapists. Nobody ever asked us about sex. People think sex is natural. So we're supposed to know what to do. And we're supposed to not need to ask. So, or we're supposed to think, well, if I ask, then either I'm breaking a taboo or I'm stupid for not knowing. Including with our partners, people don't realize that everybody's different and we need to find out what our partner's like because it may not necessarily be what we like or what the person in the porn video that we just watched liked. So we need to talk about it. So the therapist needs to be get comfortable to say penis, vagina, masturbate, 
clitoris, you know, say these words out loud without shame so that client becomes comfortable and also gets the message that it's okay to talk about this stuff. In fact, inviting them to talk about this stuff. Now, what is really particular about um, neglect and sexuality is that one of the hallmarks of neglect is self-reliance. What the child of neglect learns to do is disavow interpersonal need. I don't need anyone. That's how I defend against the fact that there is nobody there to need. So the person goes through their life pretty much being able to do everything themselves, except that sex pre presents a kind of a, a problem about that. Because even though I can do it all myself, I can masturbate, it's not the same thing. So many children of neglect develop a kind of aberration of sexuality where they can have sex with another without needing. So they might find their sexual world will be in the cyber world. So having sex with people on screens only, or having sex with sex workers, or having anonymous sex, or serial infidelities, or partnering with somebody who won't have sex with them, like our sexual abuse trauma survivors who are unable for a long time to, you know, feel safe enough to have sex. So then they're in a partnership for years with someone who won't have sex with them. And the way they kind of manage their sexual frustration is by this chronic fighting about sex. So the way around sexuality is these disconnected, unrelated ways of being sexual. So we need to be able to, A, talk about sex out loud so people will feel free and comfortable and able to talk about sex with us and to ask questions as if it's normal to not know and to need to ask. And then actually to begin to teach people what to do which is what my first book was about, uh, Coming Home to Passion, um, which it's interesting. It's it's a 10-year-old book, or no, I came out in 2010, and um, it keeps on selling because people need to know this stuff and people still don't know what to do. Sex, it's, it's interesting in our culture. We're so titillated all the time. Everything is sold with sex, but there's a complete poverty of information about sex, good information. So we can be pioneers by providing good information about sex. And if people need recommendations for good things to read about sex, feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to share resources because there's a lot of good stuff and good, um, good advice for how to help people begin to um, feel and express and communicate and share their sexuality again. I'll say one more thing about sex before we before I ask you to tell me what to talk about because I, <laughs> I go on these long tangents. Um, back in the early 2000s, the uh, diagnosis du jour was sex addiction, which is a completely bogus designation. There's no research. There's no, there's no nothing about it. And there's a huge industry that sprang up around it. And kind of like this scare, it was kind of like in the early days, um, I remember when I first read um, Marx, Karl Marx, it starts, a specter is haunting Europe. And it seemed like that around this sex addiction thing, that there was this scary monster that was kind of creeping up in the land, and that sex addiction. It's mm. completely bogus. And in the sex therapy field, people would say, anybody who has sex more than I do is a sex addict. And that's <laughs> kind of how it worked out, that <laughs> partners would be freaked out and come in and say, my partner's a sex addict, or my, or one would say, my wife just kicked me out. She says I'm a sex addict, and they think they are. And I, 
for a while I was getting these panic phone calls like every day. And now it's not so much the fad anymore, but it really did a disservice because a lot of our neglect survivors do have this compulsive urge to self-regulate. They don't know how. So they're kind of killing two birds with one stone by looking for ways to calm down the nervous system and looking for ways to resolve this conundrum about sex, meaning I need somebody, but I don't need anybody. And how do you regulate that? And some people regulated it with quantity. So sex addiction was a real disservice to our, to our goals. But so I only say this so that therapists don't get sort of just deterred or get kind of swayed by that myth because it's not real. There's nothing to it. And there's good literature. Once again, if you want to know what to read about that topic, please ask me and I'll happily recommend resources. So I'll be quiet now and let you ask me. Yeah. Um, so I really like this approach. And part of what I hear about talking around the, um, you know, talking about sex therapy and, and the, the, the vital role of sex in people's lives is, um, is that uh, there, it's finally about a mutual like regulation, co-regulating with someone finally seems, seems like the thing. So there is this question about, you know, what, what is the, what is the level of reciprocity that somebody is able to um, to create in their in their life? Um, and I wonder. Um, I, I listened to an excerpt of a of an interview that you did many years ago, where you talked a little bit about this uh, different in couples therapy, the, how the approach of talking about the dynamics of different personalities rather than trying to posited as like one person has done something bad and the other person is a victim and so on. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about about how that and, I, and then, I, then I would like to talk a little bit about neurofeedback because. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'll see if I can hit both of those. Okay. Of time. One thing that I find fascinating about uh, the millions of things that I find fascinating about sexuality and they say people become therapists because we think about sex or people become sex therapists because we think about sex 24 hours a day and i think that might be true it it, it certainly has I, well i'll leave it at that um anyway one thing that's very interesting about sex is that it involves both parasympathetic and sympathetic at the same time which means you need excitement and you also need calm. You need to be aroused and you need to feel safe. So you've got these two people and what generally happens, what I see so often is the person with incident trauma, like some kind of violent trauma, like sexual abuse or some other kind of violent, um, what we're accustomed to identifying as the traumatized person pairs up with somebody who is under aroused like this neglect person. And so we've got these very differently wired nervous systems. So we've got that going on. And then layered on top of it, we've got all these relationship dynamics. The first thing that I always, always make a point of, and I'm really pretty much of a, you know, hardcore pain, pain in the, you know, what kind of therapist about this, um, it's always 50-50. So even though the neglect survivor who thinks nothing happened to me is also inclined to say, I didn't do anything. And it's the same thing. And often the, the other partner, the traumatized person is feeling like, yeah, you didn't do anything. I am out here by myself. Um, and so becoming aware of one's own dynamics and really doing what I call staying in one's own yard instead of being focused on what the other is doing or not doing. And then once we really begin staying in our own yard, being able to speak about our own experience, we begin to see the interplay between my story and your story. 
And interestingly, of all my um, blog posts that have ever been posted, the one that got the most hits ever, I mean, so many hits, is a chapter from the first book. It's called Cycles of Escalation. And it's all about the interplay between these triggered states where one partner gets activated and then the other partner gets activated by the activation and reacts to that. And then the other partner reacts to that. And we've got all-star tennis before you know it. It's this whack, 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 whack of triggering. And all the problems, including the problems about sex, are this interplay of two people's story. So the way we process is by really getting back in your own yard, knowing your own story, beginning to see how what's happening with my partner is activating my story. And we're kind of hooking each other in these feedback loops that go on and on and on. So we keep getting the same result. So what we're doing is making people aware, helping people become aware of their own dynamic, which is no small feat because I would much rather believe that it's all you than that I have a part in it. Mm -hmm. And right. I always do. In fact, when I first met my husband and I had been a therapist for a long time, although I hadn't been a couples therapist, I thought, you know, I'm so much more um, healed than he is, but I was back to square one because we were reenacting our stories together just like everybody else. And he's one of my greatest teachers because, you know, so much I learned in the trenches with him. So that's a really good segue to the neurofeedback part. Because what, what I, one of the things I love about neurofeedback, and I said this before, but I'll say it again, is that people can work without having to go into story people can actually address the trauma, and I mean neglect trauma as well as incident trauma. People can address the trauma without having to go back into the tired old story that they've been struggling with and dealing with for years before they get to us. And so many people have are so tired of telling that miserable story and want it to go away. And with neurofeedback, we don't have to. And Ruth and Seaburn have been really important to me. And that's one reason why I'm so thrilled and honored and, and very pleased that they will be with us um, on the last day for Q&A because they have the, because Ruth has the neuroscience and Seaburn has the neurofeedback expertise that kind of provide the foundation for all this anecdotal stuff that I've been very doggedly collecting over the years. They have the science that really gives it some ground. And so they can, they can explain that as well as give the kind of instruction about what to do neurofeedback wise so much better than I can. Now, granted, I grew up in a time when girls were told that we're dumb in science and math. So I really grew up believing that. And when Bessel started talking about the brain in 1990, it was like this whole new way of learning to use my brain. But I'm still not nearly as fluent and as strong as I'd like to be around the neuroscience and the neurofeedback parts. So Seaburn can really help us with questions of like sites where we put the electrodes and frequencies and durations to help us really address these sexual issues. And the um, neglect survivor might be hyper aroused in the sexual realm, which means in the part of the brain that is more sensory um, motor that they need to lower arousal and maybe in the emotional 
which is how they communicate the attachment piece, they're under aroused. So in the, in the emotional part of the brain, the right limbic, we need to raise the levels. Anyway, they are going to be here to help us more with that. And it's not simple and it's not quick. And what we know with all developmental trauma is much as we would love to be able to knock it out in 20 sessions, even with neurofeedback, we can't do that. And I know that Seaburn, you know, I listened to the webinars so many times, I know their, I know their, their webinars by heart. And Seaburn said something in one of hers where she she put in her book that it takes anywhere from 150 to 350 neurofeedback sessions to treat developmental trauma. And she's sort of covering herself in case insurance ever starts paying that they will expect that it takes a long time. But you know what? It's true. At least for me, I'm not skilled the way Seaburn is, but um, it does take time and it does take work and it does take patience and, and a partner who is committed to working on it too. So um, these, these problems can really be helped by neurofeedback and probably better than most other nonverbal modalities, which brings me to another point. And that is that with neglect, because it is so centered on attachment and the failure of attachment and the failure, the poverty of mirroring, which is that essential gazing function where the mother's actually seeing the baby and the baby looks into the mother's eyes and sees a reflection, I see a reflection of me. I look into your eyes, I see a reflection of me. That's how I develop a self. If there's nobody there, I never get comfortable with looking into the eyes of the other. So this is a really important point that neurofeedback is necessary and not sufficient. The therapeutic relationship is necessary and not sufficient. We have to have both. So I won't do, or I really try not to do, neurofeedback with somebody else's therapy client. And I absolutely insist when I do neurofeedback that there's enough time to do both because both are essential for healing these problems where relationship and lack of relationship is so much at the core of it. So Lars, should I be quiet and make room for questions? Um, what are we doing today? I know there isn't that much time left and I know I've gone on and on about a lot of things. I hope I haven't gone the wrong direction. Well, I have really enjoyed this conversation, uh, Ruth. So thank you. And um, if there are, uh, it, it occurs to me that some of the things that we've talked about today may be triggering for some folks who are on the call. And so, and I also know that there are a number of very skilled clinicians that are in in the in the room today and as part of the call. So I, I, I will offer if uh, if somebody wants to discuss that with a clinician, if there are, if there are clinicians who are here today who are open to doing that, we can set up a breakout room where you can just go and have a one on one and talk to somebody about what's come up for you, um, because you know the the whole. Um, uh, vision of this of the work that we're doing is to create safe safer places for people to be able to explore these questions so just wanted to put that out um and the uh i guess one i i will ask one other question if other people have questions there was one question about the strange situation which we could maybe go into more in the course um uh, uh, I see that the breakout room is available. So please write to Cole. He's our, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to talk to somebody, um, if you're willing to be available to listen, uh, then just let Cole know and, and then Cole can kind of, uh, make that, make that all work. But I was, I was thinking the one other thing that occurred to me, Ruth, is, um, 
for folks who are starting out doing this thing, you really like you when you started out doing this work with neurofeedback and neglect and development of trauma and, and couples therapy and so on. Um, you really it was a lot of exploration, a, a lot of really courageous kind of going out. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm just going to follow my intuition here. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that process would like was like for you for the benefit of people who are who are just feeling like I it's too much I don't, I don't know what to do mm -hmm. well I, I'm not an advice giver but the one thing that I always say by way of advice and I believe every little bit of success I've ever had comes from this one piece of advice and that is find the best consultation money can buy tell them everything and do what I'm told. And I had the good fortune when I first trained in neurofeedback in 2009, um, and I was so thrilled. And Seaburn was a, a guest speaker at my neurofeedback training, my very first weekend of neurofeedback training. And I was so shy and I was so you know, scared and I was so embarrassed, but I approached her and I asked her if she would mentor me. And she, I was convinced she didn't like me, but she agreed to. And I got on her calendar in 2009, and I have greedily held on to my spot on Seaburn's calendar ever since. So I consult with her. And what I recommend doing is find the best person that you can and tell the truth about everything, including what you're really ashamed of, your worst mistakes, your dumb questions, or your hypotheses, because so much of what I was putting together was anecdotal. I remember once, um, as I was writing the my most recent book, I called Ruth Lanius and I said, I see so much ADD among neglect survivors. And they're so understimulated in the front. My hypothesis is that it's from the failure of mirroring that um, that these people are are attention deficit. Their their prefrontal is kind of groggy and slow. Is that is that accurate? Is it from the lack of attunement, the lack of gazing, that people come up understimulated in the front and slow, and these very smart people wind up with ADD? Does that fit? Is that like neuroscientifically sound? And, and Ruth said yes. And so I could kind of take that intuition and go with it. And so what we want to do is Find the people that we trust and go to them with our questions and not have the hubris to believe our own anecdotal experience of which I had so much. And the first years of, of studying neglect, it was so anecdotal. And as I learned about sex and I got into the sex therapy field, I had to once again kind of bite the bullet, be really humble and scared and approach these people who I thought were bigger than life and ask them questions and ask them for consultation and ask them for help and ask them for feedback. And that's how I learned. And then little by little beginning to sort of amass this little body of of ideas and put them together and find out from experience like, yeah, this keeps working. There must be something to this, but always looking for those people, those resources. I read like a, I can't stop reading. And um, so to really look for the expertise and have the humility to learn and learn and learn. And for myself, one of the blessings of EEG Learn is that my hunger to keep learning and not have live conferences has been really fed by you, Lars, because you put these wonderful things together that I'm so grateful for. Keep learning because it's infinite and the field keeps growing. You look at somebody like Bessel, he's on to the next thing all the time. Like now he's studying psychedelics, 
which is another way of looking at the brain and how we kind of create more connectivity in different ways quicker and how we put all these things together. And I, I, to answer your question, you know, in a nutshell, we find the best consultation money can buy and ask them and do what they tell us to do because my intuition might be a good beginning, but I need a whole lot more um, kind of reassurance and grounding before I can really trust myself with all these precious and delicate nervous systems. I hope that answers the question. That's great. That's great. So there's one Let's comment. Also, one last thing, not sure, right, sure. because you reminded me before we started about self-regulation. This work is so hard. We have to take care of our own system. We have to do our own neurofeedback. We have to, I mean, for me, the cheese making, stirring the vat is um, how I stay minimally sane. And it's essential to find enough balance between how much we do this work and how we kind of restore our own systems because it can be really dysregulating. It's hard work. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, there was a question for some from someone who wanted to stay anonymous. Um, uh, maybe the focus of sexual relationship for the adult child of neglect is on fulfilling his or her partner's wants and needs and having zero awareness that he, she too um, has wants, needs, and desires, the fond trauma response. I'm curious to learn more about the fond trauma response in your course in relation to the child of neglect and how this response is used to control all of his or her relationships. Also, uh, you know, this is really a, a question to begin a book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, how this trauma response goes unrecognized, possibly for life, because the behaviors of the trauma response are so accepted or even chronically praised by society. Yes, absolutely. And what I will say to that, which is the nutshell answer, and it's a huge question, we could do a whole series on that, um, is many of these couples, and often these people are partnered for many years, have a, what I call the grand collusion. And the grand collusion is where we've got one partner who has this endless need and that person is tagged as the one with the problem and the one with the pain. And they get what I always call all the blame and all the help. And then we have the other partner who is the endurer and they do without and they are caretakers and they tolerate and they wait and they get more and more angry and often they leave and often they don't. But um, to begin to name the collusion, because that partner is off the hook. They don't have they don't have problems. They're off the hook and they also don't get any help. So they keep being invisible the way but they've always been. But they're blameless, which is how they like to think of themselves. And the traumatized person or the designated traumatized person is the problem child and creates all the trouble, but also needs all the care. So what we want to do is really identify that dynamic and then help the neglect survivor, and they're often so disconnected from emotion because the way we learn to feel, name, express emotion is through the relationship, the primary early, early attachment relationship. And when that doesn't happen, there's a major disconnect from one's own self and one's own emotion. So the neglect survivor needs to learn to even feel, let alone name and express what they're feeling. And so it's a painstaking process. It involves a real role evolution, as well as stopping that feedback loop, that mm -hmm. same feedback loop. That's a, it's a big topic. Yeah, 
Thank you. So we're at our one o'clock time, and I don't know, uh, there are a couple of other questions that have come up. Um, and uh, and I, I, I'm i okay with taking a few extra minutes. I don't know what your time frame is, Drew. Yeah, and, and then we can post that recording if folk, some folks may have other meetings at one or whatever, or whatever the, at the hour. Um, uh, and um, I just wanted to re to mention to make sure that people understand that the uh, the course begins next uh, Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, um, and uh, there will be uh, four sessions. And on the on the fourth one, uh, we'll be joined by Seaburn Fisher and Ruth Lanis and and uh, for a lively conversation about all these topics. Um, so and there's more. Uh, I think Cole has posted the uh, the link to to go to the landing page to find out more. There's an introductory video by by Ruth about what the course will be covering, um, and we hope that everyone will feel comfortable coming and joining us. Um, and what I'd like to do actually for the course, Ruth, is uh, talk to you a little bit more as someone who reads a lot. Uh, maybe we could put together a there's your book, excellent book on neglect. But I also just just before this decided to take a look and see if there was other. And there actually is quite a quite a bit of. Of work out there, and if Not there's much that I like, okay, well, then that would be good to to know. Not that we need to throw shade, but uh, you know, maybe if there if there is any work on that stuff, you know, putting together a reading list and allowing uh, people who sign up for the course to really get a uh, you know some sense of that. Um, and uh, I, there's one question. I'll just maybe I'll throw these questions out, and then and then we'll see. I mean, just for folks to know, if you're joining the course, there will be Q and A during the course as well. So, um, and the the best Q and A will be on the last day because we'll have the like top of the top to ask the questions to. I'm so thrilled about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Guy Bowman, who's a long time, also a long time eager clinician, um, asks, uh, Ruth, in your example of underdeveloped frontal lobe, what kind of brain activity would you expect? Too much slow wave? What would you train? Excess down or something more activating? And I don't know that we need to necessarily get into particularities about like sites and frequencies. Um, but I wonder if there's if if there's something to talk about that the the in more general terms about you know what what approaching how you how you would approach that kind of uh, that 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 presentation. Sure. Um, first of all, I would say save the neurofeedback questions for Seaburn because she's so much better than I am with that stuff. What I will also say is generally when the child of neglect comes to me, um, that's not what they need help with most. What they're most wanting help with is waking up the emotional part of the brain, which is um, they can't access their emotion. So we're not, most often we're not dealing with prefrontal material, at least not at the beginning. We might be dealing with um, more sensory motor strip, like bodily or um, emotional. And so what I've done a lot lately, um, especially in the last two years or so, is use the Alpha Down, which um, is one of Ruth Lanius's protocols, which raises, which raises alpha by the rebound. And um, it's very interesting. People tend to feel better and feel more and become able to articulate better. Usually the, the prefrontal material comes much later on in the, in the work. But that's not what's troubling them as much. And often I'll say one last thing about this. Often these people are really disabled in the interpersonal and extremely competent in their like professional lives. And I have so many people that are really, really competent, smart, um, educated, um, successful people in the, in the world of prefrontal, except where the interpersonal is concerned. So they may have these attentional difficulties, they still get a lot done. 
So it, it may not be what troubles them most when they start. That's great. And Seaburn's the best one to talk to about those things. That's great. Thank you so much, Ruth. This has been really, really, uh, I, I just have really, you know, learned in our conversation just in the last hour. It's not every hour of every day that <laughs> you come away with new ideas. Um, I hope this has been helpful to folks who've joined us today. Um, and uh, we certainly look forward to seeing you all uh, when we start next Friday uh, to go through uh, talking about this stuff. And if you um, are interested in reading more about um, Ruth's approach and uh, and so on, her website is wonderful. Um, uh, you can just do a search for Ruth Cohn uh, therapist. That's what I did. And, and it'll take you. She's the first uh, thing. It's also, I have a, a little book that I that I put together of the blogs, and um, it's available on Amazon for free in the electronic version. Oh. And um, so if people want a little something that doesn't cost them anything and they don't mind reading online, you can go on Amazon. It's called Out of My Mind. And it's a little book of the blogs. And we're, we're starting a series. I've got the first one up there. And if you go on Amazon and click on Out of My Mind, if you get the Kindle version, that's free. And um, I also wanted to say I apologize for not thinking about triggering people. I My head was too full of stuff. And I didn't think about that enough. And I'm sorry. And the other thing I wanted to say as we end is... My cheese making teacher, who I adore, his name is Gavin, and he's in Australia. And at the end of every session, every chat, he always says, See you next time. So <laughs> I will say to everybody, See you next time. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>